And so it would be, I remember David Brody was the first speaker. He was a, a distinguished U.S. labor historian had written on the steel workers and workers in industrial America, really important book. So he came down to talk about labor today and he addressed uh, the long, mainly longshoremen, longshore affiliates, retirees and current, mem current so. members of the union. And, uh, and that was before, that was while fundraising was in process. So the labor, you had a labor studies course where longshoremen and pensioners were coming to the court. No, they, well, they could, uh -huh. they could. And in one case, I remember um, uh, uh, Fern Hallgren, John Hallgren's mother, she took the course. And she was a real con a contributor to the course. But that was rare, that, mm -hmm. that uh, someone from the community would, would take the course. But everyone who taught in the course uh, had, there, there was charged with giving a public lecture, and it was usually at the ILW Hall. And then in addition, they would write um, a working paper uh, uh, summarizing that lecture for distribution in print form uh, and we would send those later on we began to send them to labor centers and scholars at uh, all over the world really. So do you think the lectures at the uh, at the hall helped with the fundraising for the chair? I think it could have yeah I think it was part of a well, it certainly, and it certainly helped build rapport between the, th those of us in the university teaching labor studies and, uh, and those in the, in the union, ILWU, and in the broader labor community, because people would come in from other unions mm -hmm. as well. And sometimes we, we did it at, uh, in other venues, at other halls, like the machinists, uh, hall we did once and so I think that helped that helped and then I don't remember at what point the chair was actually established but once it was established then the chair began to furnish funds for this course mm -hmm. and so, and this course went on during the 90s for several years um, and of course fundraising continued during that whole period even after the first million was raised. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so you think that course was, was really a big part of establishing that campus, off-campus relationship? Yeah, I think, I think that was, uh, well that was, that was the vision that I thought that the, the funders of the chair had. I mean, we, we from the beginning, we, I think there was a meeting of the minds that this chair would serve as a bridge between scholarship and activism and between the academy and the labor movement. And, um, and so uh, a course like this was, and the working paper and the lecture that at the hall that came from it was all part of this. And it was really good for the students to go down to the hall. Mm -hmm. Most of them had never been in a union hall. And even though many of them were sympathetic toward labor, it was a great experience to walk into the kind of the board, I don't know what you call it, like the boardroom of the ILWU with all the photographs and the symbols of the labor struggles and then meet uh, you know, old timers and and activists uh, after the lecture and so on. That was a, it was a, it was building bridges. Mm -hmm. So um, you received this Fulbright, and you um, this was kind of af after the class, the course courses were wrapping up. And you went away for two years? One year. There. One year. And then you returned in the middle of David's. Right. So and, and actually, uh, 
the, his first assistant was one of my graduate students. So I kind of had a, a, a pair of eyes uh, in, in, uh, on scene, so to speak. So could you talk a little bit about what David Olson was doing as chair? Sure. In his first well, I mean, uh, the whole, info, everything had to be kind of established, like what would the visiting committee be like? What would its duties be? What would the steering committee, that was the group of faculty that would advise the chair. How big would it be? How would it be approved by the different departments? How would future chairs be named? All these kind of nuts and bolts of the institution building, um, David had to take on. And of course, fundraising continued to be a big issue and uh, David and Steve Marquardt, who was his assistant, he, he had kind of had the job you have now, Andrew, uh, and he was very uh, effective. They, they they had to grapple with all these issues, and they had to produce um, the newsletter and and run a contest for its name and th those kinds of things. So there were there were. And then uh, once I came back, of course, I participated in a lot of these decisions as part of a member of the steering committee. Um, and so after David's uh, term was up, yeah. what, and you became chair, what were the goals that you brought with you um, right. as, as chair at the center? Well, the, the, I think I've already kind of stated them. I mean, I was very concerned that um, our center should be a beacon for scholarship. That is, it should be a place where people who studied labor, no matter the discipline, whether it be history or political science or sociology or industrial relations or so on, could look to, for new ideas and solid information and that um, that at the same time that, that the center would facilitate the diffusion of this knowledge to the broader labor movement, not only uh, national but international as well. And of course as a Latin Americanist I was especially concerned with the international and comparative dimensions of, of, of labor studies so that, in fact, the course that I continued to teach and now had funding from the Bridges Center was called Comparative Labor History. And so each year we would concentrate on a different world region. So one year we did uh, Europe, another year we did Asia. And we would bring in the top people, for example, on the Asian one, the top person in China, labor studies was uh, she she came in and she's now at Harvard Elizabeth Perry, but she uh, she taught that course. Uh, Andrew Gordon came in; he's a leading scholar of Japanese labor, and so we continued to do that. And I thought that the international dimension was really important. So I guess uh, everything that I tried to do, I mean, I would run, we would run conferences. I remember one of them was about the future of labor in the world economy. And we bought it, brought in Giovanni Arrighi uh, to give the keynote speech for that. And he was a really distinguished Italian labor studies person who recently died and there was a major conference held in his honor in Italy. Um, but anyway, that was, uh, those were among the main issues. I thought that it was important to teach uh, labor courses and we tried to facilitate that. At, uh, and, and I think we have never succeeded in another dimension which was to attract more graduate students from around the country 
to come to specialize in labor studies. And we, we established a few incentives to bring people and some people did come and they would come in the summer to take this course. But the, what I had hoped would uh, evolve into a really dynamic program of graduate studies in labor studies. Uh, I mean, we've made some progress along that route, but I think that we could do a lot more. And uh, that was, uh, that's one area that I think we need to redouble our efforts. And we have, over the years, as these different funds have been established, quite apart from the chair itself, but in honor of different activists and so on, um, we now are able to fund uh, both undergraduate and graduate studies to a, a, a larger extent than we were able to do. But that's an area that, well, the whole University of Washington, it's among its weakest dimensions is graduate education and funding for graduate education. I mean, the quality of the university is much higher than the uh, its competitive ability to attract first-rate graduate students to our programs. We attract some, but not enough. And so we're at a disadvantage with other good universities in financial aid for graduate work. So of, of the things that you did as chair, uh, what do you think Every, every chair comes in with their own goals, their own interests, yeah. and does things, and establishes things at the same, yeah. and leaves a legacy. Yeah. Um, what do you think has been the legacy of your ten, uh, your term as the chair? Well, it's just pretty much what I've said. You know, I mean, I, uh, I think it was the international and comparative and the teaching uh, and research uh, dimensions that that I've already outlined. Uh, I mean, everybody, I think each chair has brought, uh, like for example, the current chair, um, Jim Gregory has, you know, emphasized the archival uh, dimension of our program. So each person has brought a special um, con set of concerns. But I think my concerns were comparative, international, and scholarly, I would say. Um, and, uh, and we achieved some of the, those goals, but not all of them. Uh, so as, the, as, the, as your term ended and the centers continued on, um, what are some ways that you've remained in, involved? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I've continued, I continued to teach. Um, labor history, uh, comparative labor, uh, and and of course I've continued to teach in Latin America as well, especially in Colombia, which of course, as you know, is is one of the toughest places to be a unionist in the world, maybe the toughest. And. Um, uh, but I've continued, uh, I think one of the great things, even uh, I've ret I retired in 2005, um, but I've continued uh, to be a part of the steering committee, and I enjoyed doing that, and I, uh, um, I think it's, it's important, both David Olson and I continue to serve on that committee, and we provide kind of an institutional memory, a lot of experience and um, understanding of the earliest uh, period of the chair. And I think that's, that that's been very good for both the program and for us so that we don't forget what we, what we were about when we were working every day. The other thing that I've, uh, I, I continue to do is I'm involved with the Labor Center at uh, Seattle Community College. What's it called? The, the Labor Education Labor, yeah. uh, Research. 
Right. And uh, actually, Sarah Laslett, who of course worked in the at, at, for the Bridges Chair, she and I have been thinking about offering a course there, uh, co-teaching a course there. So. Uh, I think that, you know, I know there is, continues to be a lot of cooperation between those two institutions. And that institution at um, South Seattle is growing. And, uh, and I think that that's an important dimension of the Bridges Center too, that have this link to labor education, at nuts and bolts of labor education in the labor movement. So now that you've talked a bit about um, your own work with the center, yeah. um, maybe we could talk a little more broadly about um, the Bridges Center and its importance and the role it has to play. Right. Um, so very generally, who was Harry Bridges and what to you was his importance? Yeah. Well, I had, um, I knew about Harry Bridges because I had read by the time I came back to the University of Washington, I'd read quite a lot of U.S. labor history. Um, and I knew that uh, this union that he had helped to found continued to be perhaps the most democratic labor union in the United States and had a had a real presence in the international sphere as well. It was, played a role in um, democratic labor causes worldwide. So uh, there was no doubt that when the, uh, the possibility that I could be associated with such a legacy, it was a great honor and uh, I mean, Many of my friends have academic chairs, right? Either in history or Latin, and they're all named for capitalists, you know? They're all named for rich people. And uh, often people, I mean, some of these people are fine people, I'm not saying that, but uh, the idea that you could honor a democratic militant labor leader uh, with a chair was quite an extraordinary idea. And uh, of course the chair, once it was funded, is the only one I think in the United States named for a labor, uh, a, a labor leader. Uh, so, you know, there are probably, at the University of Washington, there are hundreds of chairs all of them funded with a million plus or two million now plus, but uh, there's only one that is, there, most of these people are, made their money as financiers or as entrepreneurs or something, but only one as a representative of the people who do the work. So if you met someone um say that, um, and who had never heard of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies, and you had to describe to them what the Harry Bridges Center is and what it does. Yeah. How would you describe, describe it? Well, it would be in part what I've already said, but, I, but I, 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 I'll be happy to say it again because I think it's very important. I mean, some, some labor centers in the, in the world and in the U.S., conceive of themselves as kind of a nuts and bolts uh, service entity for labor unions. We, we do some of that at the Bridges Center, but I think our conception from the beginning was to do more than that, and that was to try to link the world of scholarship, that is studies of labor, with um, the people who actually uh, are charged with implementing labor's goals, people on the ground, right? So that 
you know, this, this idea of linking, of bridging these two worlds uh, has always been paramount, I think, in the Bridges Centers and makes it unique. That is, there is a much more emphasis on, uh, on the scholarship. Um, and the idea is that, look, labor's got a lot of problems, as we all know. And that scholarship can help, should be able to help, in some small way at least, to solve some of these problems. And so the, the world of scholarship, which it tries to study why labor, for example, why labor density, why union density has fallen so dramatically in the United States, what are the factors that have influenced that? Well, there's a lot of literature out there now, and a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly is it, to what extent is it globalization, to what extent is it failures of organization, to what extent is it an ideological offensive that has been dreamed up and implemented by finance capital or the neoconservative agenda or the neoliberal agenda. No. So, so that's the, you know, that's, that, 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 that's kind of the main, that's what we always kind of keep in mind when we talk about how we apportion funds, where we put our effort. Uh, those are the kinds of criteria that we try to uh, involve and implement. Well, um, don't be concerned about repeating yourself because there's always, when we go back and edit this, it's always great to have. Right. If you're saying the same thing more than once, it's always good to have. Great. You okay. More than no problem. Things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but um, so with those goals, can you think of a specific example of a time when um, a Bridges Center activity or scholarship has contributed to? has contributed to um, maybe conversations in the labor community or scholarship. It's an example of the Bridges Center activity or scholarship that has um, benefited the labor movement. I guess. Yeah. An example of that, uh, you know. No, I can't think of a single case. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, we've had some really good discussions, you know, but I don't think you can say Okay, well, as a result of Giovanni Arrighi, you know, coming and talking about the future of the labor movement, which got a lot, when he gave, he, he gave a speech and he said, you know, things don't look so good. Things don't look so good for the international labor movement. And, and a lot of people in the audience said, well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't come here to hear a pessimistic, uh, uh, assessment of the future of labor and he laughed and he said he said uh, you Americans you know you're always so optimistic he said as an Italian he says we've been declining since Rome <laughs> so but he gave a series of structural reasons for this decline that I think people carried away at least a better sense of the magnitude of the problem how you operationalize this, you know, is quite another matter. But I think that it's important to have a space to think about problems. And that it, uh, I don't think it's easy to point to, well, as a result of this, we, we passed such and such legislation or we were able to organize this sector of the labor movement. Although I do think that discussions of gender and discussions of ethnicity and so on, and discussions of union democracy and all these things, they do add grains of sand out there for people who are involved in these struggles. Um, well, I think I can think of a few examples where the Bridges Center has been a catalyst, um, especially for students yeah. on campus. Oh, for sure. Um, do you have, could you so yeah, SLAP is... Yeah, what uh, students have done on campus. Yeah. Well, the whole sweatshop thing, that, that's that been a big thing. And the, the, the fact that they were able to 
move the university to take a principled stand on on how on the what kind of sportswear is is you know it, it gets the nod from the university that's been a big thing I think that um, I think the students have actually been the best example of and a lot of those students have be have become have been stalwarts in the Bridges Center too I mean they've been in courses but they've also been uh, teaching assistants and they've been RAs and those uh, research assistants and so on. Yeah, that's a good example, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular students that come to mind? Yeah, uh, Jeremy Simmer was one, uh, and I think he's now he's now in Portland. I mm -hmm. think uh, yeah, it, working on and, and healthcare. Campus. Yeah, single payer healthcare. Mm -hmm. He's. A, he, uh, he's a good example of that, and there have been many others. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to start asking you a little bit about some of the personalities that helped start the center. Great. Um, and ask your memories about them. Yeah. Um, and we'll start with the folks that um, are, are no longer with us. Um, can you tell me a bit about um, your memories of Martin Juggum and what <laughs> his role in the, yeah. in the founding of this? the chair was? Yeah, I, I can. Well, he was one of a kind, that's for sure. And uh, anybody who ever heard him speak will never forget him. Uh, the thing that I like remember most was we would have these meetings of uh, the people uh, raising the fundraising committee and the administration of the university, the deans and the deans, you know, they're like our bosses, and so the faculty's bosses, right? So usually we treat them with, uh, I mean, we hold them at arm's length, so to speak, uh, and think of them more as bosses than as colleagues. But in fact, especially in the old days, many of them really were colleagues and they did have the interests of the faculty and the students really at heart. Now, it seems to me that a lot of the administrators at the university have become more corporate in tone and action than in the old days. But at any rate, when we'd have these meetings, Martin Juggum would hold forth and he'd enunciate these simple truths about democracy and about morality and about what was right. And he'd bring out the democratic uh, characteristic dimensions of some of these administrators and they'd remember who they really were. And they'd start acting being much more human and humane, I thought. So I always enjoyed the meetings with them. He'd make them laugh and and he'd bring them along and I think help carry the day many times. Um, he when he was uh, when he was gravely ill, I would go to visit him up here here in West Seattle and. Uh, he was uh, he was a tough guy right up to the end, and I uh, I have really fond memories of Jagat. So, what were some of the things that he would when you meet have the meetings with the chair with the dean? What were some of the things that were important to him about the chair? Well, he would be he would be optimistic, you know. I mean, they they people would be worried. Well, I don't know if we could raise this much. He'd say simple. He'd say, you get a thousand guys, and you get a thousand, uh, give, each of them give a thousand bucks, and you'd have a million bucks. It's as simple as that, and we can do it. <laughs> That's the kind of example he, of what he would say. So, um, 
Did you have much interaction with Phil Lally? Not that much. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't. Uh, I, I, you know, I met him and I knew him, uh, but I really didn't have that much interaction with Phil. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, who Gene Goodlock was? Oh yeah. Well, every time I'd meet Gene, meet or run into Gene, which was fairly often, she'd have a little gift for me. Uh, among other things, she gave me a little Idaho coal miner's lantern. Uh, it would go on a little metal thing that would go on your helmet. It had a little kerosene, little kerosene uh, candle in it. Uh, she'd also give me boxes of material that she'd accumulated over the years that had to do with the union, many of much of which I would then forward to the person who had your job and eventually has ended up in the archives of the center. I actually visited Jean once at her home up on the Tulalu, uh Indian Reservation up in, near Marysville and had a great uh, afternoon with her there, talking with her about her, her remembrances of when she was secretary of uh, to Harry Bridges. She was a real committed person, and uh, I had a lot of respect for her. Do you remember any of what her roles were in the in the formation of the chair, the early years of the chair? Well, I would go to meetings with her uh, at the pensioners, you know, at the first of the month. And uh, I'd often sit with her, and she'd play an active role in the discussions and always trumpeting the chair. And of course, she won the, she was came up with the title for the newsletter which was a brilliant, as, and it captured just what I was saying before about, you know, the link between scholarship and, so building bridges between scholarship and the labor movement, that was a brilliant uh, invention on her part. Uh, and I remember when you and you and I were there when when she was in the nursing home up in Everett, and by then she didn't really, she was really friendly uh, to me. She didn't remember who I was, but as you remember, they had, there was someone who came along with, who, with a guitar and would sing labor songs, and I'll be darned if she didn't remember the lyrics perfectly and sing right along with that. That was quite moving. Um, so aside from, from Jugum, Lely, and Gunlock, are there, um, what other personalities or uh, individuals do you remember? Well, well, Bob chair? Dugan, I mean, he's, he's with us, thank God, uh, but Bob was super impressive. And I think Bob played a big role in, um, in, in, in convincing people that a chair was a, a, a university chair. People didn't even know what a chair was, you know. But the idea of funding a professorship uh, at, a, at the university as a way to honor Harry Bridges and his role in building and guiding the ILWU, I think that was lar uh, in, at least a signif significantly due to Dugan's um, vision. I mean, I remember that uh, the the local in in San Francisco they were they were thinking about a museum, you know, for Harry Bridges. And but the Northwest people, is Seattle local and Tacoma local, they they went with this idea of a chair, and I think they brought along 
uh, a lot of the ILW from the whole coast because it was a better idea, much better idea. Who wants a museum when you can have a living institution that would make this bridge between scholarship and activism? Um, and then, of course, I knew at, soon after I met Bob Dugan, uh, he, he, he expressed this goal of that he was going to go talk with the development people at the university. These are the people that they're all paid to raise money for the university. So he goes to talk to the development people and they won't give him the time of day. He tells them, I'm going to, we want to raise a million dollars. We're going to get, you know, several hundred people to contribute to this chair. They're, the core people are going to be people that are associated with the ILW, but the labor movement in general. And they wouldn't give them the time of day. They, they're so used to establishing chairs. For them, you don't name a chair until you have the money in hand. Some rich guy or some you know, rich family says, we want to honor somebody, and we already have $700,000 or something. And so, so we ha virtually have the bird in hand. The idea that they would have to g spend the money to go out and make solicitations and stuff, the idea that they could raise a money for a chair democratically was kind of beyond their vision. So Dugan, luckily, he had been chair of the Alumni Association. So he went right to the president of the university. He said, these people won't give me the time of day. And Gerberding, who was the president, who was a democratic guy himself, and had a soft spot for the importance of labor in the world, he gave support to Dugan and, and support to the chair from that moment on. So he, Dugan, was able to do an end run around the development office. Um, are there other pensioners, other people that have been a part of the center since the beginning that come to mind? Yeah, my favorite, one of my favorites was Dick Mork, who was, uh, he was, uh, before he died, he was, he was a president of the pensioners. But I really liked Dick Mork. He probably subscribed to every leftist journal, you know, in print. And uh, he would go to these conferences. He would support organi the organization of any group trying to form a union anywhere within strike. He'd drive his old cars down to Portland or car would break down on the way. He'd tell me the stories of, but he was a big man, a really hu great human being. I loved having lunch with him and uh, sharing ideas about, you know, the importance of teaching about labor and uh, he was a big loss. Uh, 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 Del Castle. I remember um, Dell read my labor book, my Latin American, comparative Latin American labor book from cover to cover, and then called me on three or four points that I'd made at different points, and he had, he had read the book really carefully. Well, Dick Mork also read my stuff, and he would talk about it with me, too. So both of them these were what Marx called organic intellectuals. And they were impressive. Who but was, many, many others, you know. Who was president of uh, Local 19 and Local 23 when the chair was formed? Do you know? Well, let's see. Uh, let's see. Wenzel. Let's see, Wenzel was a bi bi biz, what do you call him, the business, business agent, business agent the BA. 
I mostly work with Wenzel, and I can't remember who was the, I really can't answer this question, Andrew. Sure. I really, I can't remember. I mean, uh, yeah, I can't, I, I, I can't, I can't remember. But, you know, I had kind of, oh, I remember we went, we went down to the, I took my class once down to the local 23. And, uh, and they showed them, uh, you know, how, how they decided who got a job, you know, how they would line up in terms of the money that they had made that month. This was really impressive to the students, you know, because in other words, those who had made the least, they got to the front of the line and the line went back and then the, the dispatcher would send these guys out. And this was a, a really important democratic institution and boy, it really hit the students in the class that this was a, quite different from the way most people get paid right or find work um, well as we break here I think I have a few more uh, questions